This is your worship email from First Church of Guilford, Connecticut, for Sunday, August 2nd, 2020. Welcome to First Congregational Church, Guilford, Connecticut, where we say, whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Well, right now, you're welcome here not in the church building, but on the church grounds, masked and distanced, while we gather together to walk in prayer, in collecting of food, and in sharing it with our neighbors and our friends. We, the staff at First Church, are so happy that you've joined us this day for worship. And we wanna let you know some things that will be happening in the future. At the end of August, we will have what we are calling a hum along. We'll have people stationed at different parts of the ground and playing music and you can come and hum so that we can find music again in our hearts. And in September, starting with the first Sunday of September, we will have the installation for my colleague, Jake Joseph, and it will be a small collection of family and his search team that will be here. And then the next week on the 13th, we will begin having in-person worship services. We will still have them online, but in person, we will begin with our senior adults, those who are 70 and older. Please check our website and you can find the information about the groups that will be coming into the sanctuary each week. We will have no more than 70 people so that we can maintain our physical distance and we will have all the requirements necessary such as temperature taking, uh, documentation and hand washing. We want you to come and we want you to be safe. For now, from your kitchen table, your garden, or your couch, be with us this morning in worship. worship we take a moment in which we breathe in the breath of God and we breathe out the love of God we roll our shoulders back we open our hands and our hearts and our minds and we find a place where we have space and we can really breathe in the breath of God and breathe out the love of God. May we continue doing so. Amen. Hello. Today's Bible story is about when Jesus feeds 5,000 people. And it really is a story about sharing what we have with the people around us. So today, I am going to share with you a special, a special piece of music. And you may recognize one of these high school students as your Sunday school teacher. I'm going to share with you this video and their music and their story of how they're sharing their gift and their talent. And it's especially moving in times like we are in right now. Enjoy. We are a heartstrings trio and we've been playing together for about five years. Sophia and Olivia play the violin and I play the cello. And um, during quarantine, 
um, did many events like birthdays and weddings. And um, now that quarantine has started, we've been able to hold some socially distanced concerts. We had one on the green for a few people. And we've also been visiting um, different um, elderly homes around this area and playing for them at socially distance, like outside. And so today we're going to be playing first um, on Dante by Schubert. At this time in the service, we invite you to pause the video for a moment. Return to the worship email if you have it and read the prayers of the people, the joys and concerns shared with the office and the clergy throughout the week. Likewise, read the pastoral prayer and the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught. Know that the prayers shared with the clergy and the office are held in sacred intention and care by the clergy and our visitors throughout the week and that we know that we are bound together by prayer no matter where we are, in every time and every place. We know that God is with us and hears our prayers. Amen.
When Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, and he cured their sick. When it was the evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. Give them something to eat. The disciples replied, We don't have anything but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to the heavens, and he blessed, and he broke the loaves, and he gave it to the disciples. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand people, women, children, and men. One of the songs that was popular when I was in high school, but has managed to stick around for almost half a century, is a tune by the Scottish band Steeler's Wheel called Stuck in the Middle with You, which includes the memorable lines, clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right, here I am, stuck in the middle with you. A pandemic anthem well before its time, don't you think? I did. As I worked on my sermon this week, only to be reminded that Ginger referenced that song in her first virtual sermon back in March. But since March feels like it was five years ago and not five months ago, the song bears repeating because we're still stuck, or so it seems. As August begins, we have gone almost five months since we last worshipped in our meeting house or chatted at coffee hour. I'm way behind on my NHQ, my Necessary Hug Quotient Quota. Because of my knee surgery in April of 2019, which sidelined me from cooking for most of the summer, our barn has gone almost a year without people gathered around our table for dinner. How I wish we could be together so that we could share what we miss and the griefs, yes, plural, the griefs we are holding. Whatever stories we are telling in these days of protest and pandemic, they are grief stories, stories of being stuck in the middle without resolution and too often without each other. I'm grateful to find that the lectionary passage was the story we most commonly know as the feeding of the 5,000, which you may not know is a grief story of its own. Our reading starts in the middle of things as lectionary passages often do. The first sentence Ginger read is the giveaway. And hearing this, Jesus withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place to be by himself. And hearing this, my English teacher comes out of me and I want to write in the margins, what is the antecedent? Well, the first 12 verses of chapter 14 give us the context. The short version is, John the Baptist was murdered by Herod on a drunken whim. His disciples buried him and then came to tell Jesus. And hearing this, Jesus did all he could to get away from everyone and everything to grieve the loss of his cousin, his colleague, and his friend. But he couldn't get away. The crowds of people hoping for healing were relentless in both their need and pursuit of him, and they followed him out of town into the desert, as did the disciples whom I, might, I mean, whom I imagine were doing their best to deal with their grief over John's death, as well as Jesus' sorrow, which was new to them as well. When Jesus became aware of what was happening, Matthew says, he was moved inwardly with compassion for the crowd. Instead of continuing to try and run away, Jesus turned back into the mass of people and began to listen to their grief stories, to share their loads, and to offer healing. This went on all day 
into the evening. The disciples' response was a little less compassionate, though I think they were trying to help. We're out here in the desert and it's after supper. Don't you think you should send them back into the villages so they don't starve? Part of being a disciple, it seems, meant to live with the grief of inadequacy, which was wearisome, I'm sure. Jesus' response was direct. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. The disciples shot back equally as straightforward. We have nothing but these five loaves and two fishes. In Matthew's version, they don't even have a cute little kid with a sack supper. They just knew they didn't have enough. The hunger of the crowd wasn't something they could solve. It didn't matter what they did. It was late in the day. They couldn't fix the problem. Send everybody home. Bring them here to me, Jesus said. And so they brought him lunch. And then he turned to the crowd and asked everyone to recline as they would for a meal. For our purposes, we will also imagine that they were masked and inappropriately distanced. He blessed the food and then he gave it to the disciples to distribute. With several thousand people on a hillside, it's hard to grasp the logistics of it all. But the people seemed to know that dinner was being served. They sat down and began to pass the food as it came to them. What started as five loaves and two fish turned into something where everyone ate and there were leftovers. The willing suspension of disbelief has always come fairly easily for me. So I've never had much of a problem with taking the miracle stories of Jesus at face value or as one of my seminary professors used to describe them as parables in event, which is to say the miracle of this meal is pointing to something other than an amazing set of circumstances. The state of my life when I read the story though often affects what I see in it. These months we have spent in quarantine where many have turned mask wearing into a violation of their constitutional rights somehow, have helped me to see that the miracle in this story is that a whole mountain of grieving people looked beyond themselves and fed one another. I don't think Jesus necessarily knew how it was all going to work out when he started handing out the fish. He just knew it was the right thing to do. If you have food and you see hungry people, you feed them. You offer what you have and then see where it goes. The lectionary passage as Ginger read stops with the count of how many were fed. And in doing so, leaves the story too quickly, which I might add, lectionary passages often do. But the next verse, verse 22 says, then he insisted that the disciples embark into the boat and precede him to the other side until he should dismiss the crowds. The day that had begun for Jesus with an ambush of grief that had sent him searching for self-isolation ended with him being not quite ready to leave after dinner was over. You go on, I'll catch up. I just want to say goodbye to everybody. And yes, I realize that is an extrovert's take on the story. Still, I think Jesus found something healing there as well. As the disciples walk down to the water, in my sacred imagination, I can hear Jesus humming, clowns to the left of me, jokers to my right, and then they went on to the next day, which held new grief of its own and some old stuff as well. Jesus 
didn't take care of people or tell the disciples to feed the crowd because it made everything better. Healing people that day didn't bring John back to life. Handing out fish and bread didn't eradicate or even lessen the Roman occupation. But they were the right things to do, the hopeful things to do on that hillside. Václav Havel was a playwright who became the president of Czechoslovakia in the late 80s. He told of something that took place just a few weeks before he unexpectedly became a head of state. He was out in the Czech countryside at a dinner party and somehow fell down a sewer pipe. In his words, he almost drowned in the fundamental mud, but someone had the wherewithal to get a long ladder and they saved him. That he was in a sewer and that he became a state official, both seemed equally absurd circumstances. With both in mind, he wrote about hope. Hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy when things are going well or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for early success, but rather an ability to work for something to succeed. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It's not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. It is this hope above all that gives us strength to live and to continually try new things, even in conditions that seem as hopeless as ours do here and now. In the face of this absurdity, life is too precious a thing to permit its devaluation by living pointlessly, emptily, without meaning, without love, and finally, without hope. We have more days ahead than we can imagine when we are not going to know how long this is going to last or what is going to happen next or when life will feel recognizable again. The days ahead are also going to leave us feeling like the disciples, I think, more often than not when it comes to how what we think we have to offer stacks up against the needs around us. Whatever happens, even in life beyond the pandemic and the quarantine and the protests, life is not going to feel like the life we think we remember. But Jesus, to use Hobble's words, didn't do what he did because he knew it all turned out okay. He did it because he was certain it made sense. He was certain it made sense to share what food they had. He was certain it made sense to stay and talk and to listen. One of the verses of our song for today says, trying to make some sense of it all, and I can see it makes no sense at all. Is it cool to fall asleep on the floor? Because I don't think I can take any more. So much of life right now doesn't make sense, from the virus to the vitriol in our national discourse. Truly, there are clowns to the left of us and jokers to the right. The world feels full of naysayers and nut jobs and ne'er do wells in pretty much every direction. It doesn't make sense to keep screaming at each other. It doesn't make sense to just wish we could go back to normal, whatever that was. It doesn't make sense to just hunker down and take care of ourselves and leave everyone else to fend for themselves. What does make sense is to do all we can to let those who are stuck in the middle with us know that we are all wonderfully and uniquely created in the image of God and worthy to be loved. What does make sense is to see these days as open space 
that offer us the chance to change how we treat one another on both personal and societal levels. We're stuck in the middle together. What makes sense is to offer all that we can, all that we have, to a hungry world. What does make sense is to feed one another any way we can, even the clowns and the jokers. Amen. Once again, we gather together apart for our time of communion. This time has been such a special part of our congregation because we always talk about it not as a habit, but as a ritual, something we do intentionally to remember the story of Jesus. And we do. We lift the bread and the cup, and we ask, oh God, your blessing upon this bread and this cup. May it nourish our bodies, and may it nourish our spirits so that we continue in this time in which we are separated one from another. In your grace we pray. Amen. Amen. We remember the story that Jesus took the bread, he held it, he broke it, and he gave it to his friends, and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Every time you take and you eat, do so in memory of me. And today in this world, we talk about knowing that systems are broken. Relationships and families are broken. Homes and schools, healthcare, things are broken. All of that is true. And yet when we come to this table, even though we are apart, we remember ourselves one to another and we remember ourselves, of course, in and with and to God. We offer our bread and our cup, and we do so in the same manner with these little cups that will be out in the memorial garden, weather permitting, and we will remind you then that you can come and take this as well. But for now, we invite you to get your bread and your wine or your juice and bring it out. Have your prayer and break your bread and then follow Jake. We remember how after supper, Jesus took the cup and he looked around at his beloved. And he poured it out and he said, this is like my lifeblood, my spirit, my essence, all that we have learned together, being poured out for you and for all that will follow in every time and every place, in abundance of hope, of perseverance, and of spirit. Take and drink. Now ministering to you with the words of Christ, we invite you to take the bread and eat. And take the cup and receive that grace. This time at home, we invite you to join us in a moment of prayer. Oh God, you have brought us around this table in a celebration of communion, of our connection in spirit to each other and to you in every place where we abide and where we know your spirit and your presence is with us. Oh God, you unite us like the pieces of this bread remembered like the droplets of this juice and wine put into our hope. O oh God, unite us also in spirit in every place that we are now, in the hopes that we will again meet in the meeting house someday. Amen. Amen. This time in our service, we traditionally have an offertory, a time to give back to God and to each other. Part of our tradition during these socially separated worship times is also a question an offering of sorts by this discussion. Feel free to pause the video and discuss this question for a second. How are you making sense of these times? What symbols are giving you strength? We ask that you continue to maintain your pledges and offerings as a way to maintain covenant and to keep our ministries vibrant and vital for everyone interacting with worship and prayer and support in these times. You may do this by paying your pledge here at 122 Broad Street through the mail drop or by mail, 
or online at www.firstchurchgilford.org. One of our members has described her weekly walk to her mailbox as a liturgical action and a way of staying connected. Thank you for joining us today for First Church Guilford by email. Join us midweek on Wednesdays for Unfiltered Live with Ginger and Jake with special guest star this week, Judy Wallace, and on Thursdays, also on Facebook Live at noon, 30 Minutes of Joy Organ Concert Series with Bill Speed. We hope you have a blessed week.